Yes, welcome to the panel on cord cutting. My name is Rob Pegorero. I write a tech column for the Washington Post for the next week. And the cable and satellite industries seem to think I don't exist. That's because I'm a cord cutter. My wife and I got rid of our satellite TV subscription in, I think, October of 2009. And our lives have actually been pretty good since. And uh, I imagine many of you are as well. Who, who here no longer pays for cable or satellite or Fios TV or whatever? Well, the, the multi-channel industry doesn't think you exist either. If you look at their public statements, the, their surveys, they seem to think this is a fringe phenomenon. Nobody really does it. Why would anybody do something as stupid as not pay for TV in the traditional pay for 200 channels when you want to watch 10 of them? I'm here to say that it is real, and we're here to discuss it and uh, get into why this is happening, what could, uh, where this is leading us. I thought I'd, I'd start by asking each of you, introduce yourself, and tell me why you're interested in this issue. Hi, I'm, I'm Marvin Amori. I'm, oh, I'm Marvin Amori. I am now a law professor at the University of Nebraska. Uh, before that, I was the po a policy lawyer at Free Press, uh, working on a range of issues, uh, including net neutrality. And I'm interested in online TV and cord cutting because I think of, uh, you know, the internet-based TV is sort of the future of free speech, uh, where we can have you know, infinite choice in what we want to watch, uh, and I'm hoping we move in that direction. I'm uh, Avner Ronen. I'm uh, the founder and CEO of Boxy. Uh, how many people here know Boxy, by the way? Uh, good. So Bo Boxy is a solution for cord cutters or cord never-getters <laughs> that, um, that still have a big screen, and they want to have you know, a great experience on their TV, but not necessarily from a cable box. So what people use Boxy for is to uh, connect to Netflix and, you know, YouTube and stream movies from uh, Vudu and MLB and, you know, a variety of other places. Miro, you know, it's one of the most popular sources um, on Boxy, TED, 4TV, and so on. So people basically either don't get cable or they have an over-the-air antenna and they com combine it with Boxy and uh, that's what you have. Uh, that's that's my setup at home. I have an over-the-air antenna because I love sports, and then I get everything else from the web, which is a great setup for me. Uh, so that's what we do. Hi, my name is Ann Jonas, and I'm with the Participatory Culture Foundation, and we create Miro, which is an open-source desktop media player, uh, Miro Community, which is an open-source web uh, video aggregation platform, Universal Subtitles, which is an open-source collaborative subtitling and captioning platform, and uh, the Miro Video Converter, which is an open-source video converter. And OPA? And Choose to say okay. uh, hi, my name is Kenyatta. Um, the multi-channel industry th believes that I exist, and um, uh, the only reason is that I still spend hundred dollars a month on cable is because I can't get access to uh, New York Knicks games uh, online in the way that I need to. Um, otherwise, why would you want to though? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Sorry, I'm a Wizards fan. I have nothing to talk about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, but, uh, uh, but I actually went 10 years without a TV, and uh, the funny thing is that uh, during those 10 years, or years I was working for PEG um, uh, Access, uh, and then uh, I left PEG to work at an art and technology lab where, you know, we were trying to invent technology to be able to get rid of, um, to get rid of uh, the cord, and then I went to work for uh, Rocket Boom, um, which was an uh, uh, online uh, content studio, which was all about how do you sort of route around networks for for getting, uh, getting content to people. And so, um, yeah, as an enthusiast of cord cutting, I'm here to speak. <laughs> Thank you, Kenyatta. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Stark. I teach at Yale University about law, technology, and culture, and have worked uh, with the folks over at the Participatory Culture Foundation um, and several others to start a group called the Open Video Alliance. It's a coalition of organizations, individuals, institutions, and so on um, to promote free expression and innovation in online video. In particular, we're interested in the potential for democratization through video. And I guess the reason why I'm on this panel is because I'm interested in the a future of video where anyone can participate and there aren't technological or cultural barriers to doing so. And I'm also interested in a world where there 
isn't you know a small group of powerful media companies controlling the video that we watch, but instead we have a means where anyone can participate. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. So the first question I thought I would ask is, you know, what's driving this? I can think of lots of reasons why you might want to dump your cable or satellite company. There's the prices that always seem to go up and up and up, the you know, lame cable boxes and DVRs, uh, the selection. W what do you see as the most important factor? Is it, you know, in my case, I can certainly say it was price, but there were other things too. What we're seeing is, I think, very similar to what happened in the 90s with wireline and, um, and mobile, is that you have now kids that go to college that never had cable. I mean, they stream stuff uh, over their computer when they lived with their parents, and then they stream stuff over their laptop, <coughs> and now iPads when they're in college, and then they go to the first apartment, and they don't need see the need to spend 80 bucks a month on cable. They spend the money on uh, broadband connection, and then they get their video from the internet. So I think there's a generational gap that is happening. And I think also for many people, they realize that either with a very basic cable subscription or with an over-the-air um, setup, and then the rest that the internet has to offer, you're pretty, you're pretty good, uh, unless you're a Knicks fan. <laughs> or uh, well, We'll be talking about sports later right, on. Right, but then you can always go down to the bar, which you know, is both social and uh, you know, your beer tab may go up, but your cable bill will go down. <laughs> I think at least part of it from what we've seen is about selection um, and that people aren't always finding content that they really feel is, is relevant and interesting to them. Um, I still do have cable, my roommates like it. Um, but oftentimes when I'm like, oh, I just wanna turn on the TV and watch something, we have hundreds of channels and I can't find something that I like. Um, whereas w through a lot of these more open internet systems, I can find content that is local, that is relevant to my interests, um, and that is often just better quality than, than what I see on cable. So I, I agree with, with both of the things that were just said, but in, in building off of the selection point, I mean, when there was all of that unrest and revolution going on in the Middle East and in Egypt, I mean, people turned to Al Jazeera English, and generally across the country, they had to watch that on the internet. People's, you know, Twitter feed would say, "Watch, a, you know, AJE.com or whatever." And uh, you know, still after, uh, mil you know, I don't know, hundreds of thousands, millions of people started watching that news on the internet. You know, Al Jazeera English went to Comcast to try to get regular cable carriage, and the economics just didn't work for Comcast. And so, a lot of people want to be able to watch what they want to watch. Uh, even if uh, it doesn't make economic sense to the cable company, especially when it's about you know, one of the most transformative revolutions going on in our time. And so that, I think, probably helped drive home a point to a lot of people that, you know, what's, wh why not watch online? There's a lot of great content there. Yeah, in my case, it was definitely, it was first looking at the cost. We, uh, you know, we'd had Dish Network for a long time, and we were reasonably happy with it. Uh, but then it was, you know, Got an HD, I got an HDTV, had to decide, okay, who's gonna get us the best selection at the best price? And it got to be such a pain, I realized I'm gonna be spending more, certainly after the initial discount wears off. And I'm still gonna be watching all the same four channels. And then fortunately, our DVR died. Something like 40 hours of recording, gone. And I no longer had to worry, how are we gonna get to that off when we send this back? And then it was easy, well, let's just get rid of it entirely and see how it goes. So I thought I'd talk about one of the things I did have to consider you know, you sort of have to, you have to break out a spreadsheet to pick a TV service because the pricing is so Byzantine. You also need to, I think, at least have a mental spreadsheet in terms of what are the channels you get, how are you going to replace them, whether it's over the air or over the internet. And in some cases, you have to decide some of these channels are expendable. I would say for me, the toughest channel to give up and the one I still miss, and w if I could just pay for it, I might, would be, uh, you know, sports, ESPN and the regional sports network in the D.C. area, Masson, I guess Comcast Sportsnet. What, what was the hardest thing for you all to give up, those of you who have fired or, or never hired a cable company? In, in my case, it was, I'll, I'll try and speak without the mic. The, does that work? It's for the recording. Oh, the recording, okay. Uh, for me as well, it's sports. I mean, you get lots of sports on the, on the broadcast networks, but you know, obviously MSG or YES in New York or ESPN still harbor a lot of content, and the original sports networks uh, do the same, and I, I think that's kind of, 
the thing that nobody talks about, but that's what the cable industry right now is focused on, is really getting all those ports right and locking them down for years, and that's probably the best defense they can play against the internet. So it has nothing to do with technology and everything to do with, um, with money and business. But what I found is that you know, I'm, I'm paying for the Major League Baseball package because I'm a big baseball fan, and between, between that and uh, the broadcast networks, I'm fine. I still miss some stuff, and I try to catch it on the web if I can. I'll be willing to pay for it um, you know, more than people paying on cable just to get it over the web, but today it's just not, not an option, which is said. Yeah, it's internet. It's internet based. The issue there is that you know, if you're a Yankees fan and you live in New York, you can't watch the Yankees. You can watch the Red Sox if you're a masochist, but you know, uh, you can't. I'm afraid you can't the score of the, the Sox Yankees game is nine four. <laughs> Wakefield is kind of getting shelled. <laughs> so yeah, over over the internet. But I I think if you know if sports is going to find an outlet online. By the way, the sports experience that you can deliver on your TV through the internet is a superior sports experience. You can get multiple angles, you can have interactive um, uh, features, you can ju uh, you know, just have a much better experience. So it has nothing to do with uh, technology and I think eventually um, the thing that's gonna have the most impact uh, is just consumers you know, voting with their wallets and with their, um, with their you know, fingers clicking on the mouse. I think that's what's gonna drive the industry eventually to serve all their content through the internet as well. How many of you uh, see this as an access issue? Like, for example, who, who's sort of willing to, who's not willing to give up uh, cable or satellite because there is that one show that you absolutely love that you freaking can't stand to watch it on a little 13 inch screen? A few, not, not many. Interesting. So, um, uh, is it, so is it, is it a question of, uh, is it, so if it's not a question of exclusive content, if it's not like, oh, I can't watch the Super Bowl live, um, what else, you know, what else is it? Uh, I think first for many people it is, you know, that they have, whether it's HBO or it's ESPN or it's the Food Network or CNN, there's stuff that they're missing that they just can't get online. And, you know, it may be them, it may be their kids, it may be their wife, it may be whatever. Uh, but somebody in the household is putting his foot down. Um, and second, there's also, I, I think there's a market awareness issue. Like most people, outside the industry don't know that they can like buy a, a, a cheap antenna and get you know 15 channels in high definition uh, channels that they think they have to pay for through cable so I think there's definitely a market education issue nobody's carrying the banner of, um, of over the air it's like you know some dinky websites and small companies and you know nobody's covering it really and consumers don't understand that they have that option P people also don't know that they can get a cable service for 16 bucks from their service providers. You know, they, it's really hidden in many cases. You know, you get the most basic packages, usually like 30 or 40 bucks uh, for people. They just hide the fact that the, there is basic cable subscription. So a lot of it is market education, in my opinion. So I actually just wanted to comment about uh, the setup that I currently have. Um, so my roommates and I have a large monitor, and we used to have a projector, although the person that had it moved out. And we just hook up our laptop to a large monitor, and the idea of having a TV to us is actually quite foreign. Um, fairly recently, I was invited to debate the general counsel of a very large media corporation. I was not actually told I was going to be debating the general counsel, and then I think the night before they said, oh, by the way, we're going to bring you in to debate this person. Uh, so that's how they wrote me in. But I was the person to come along and essentially tell them that there was this entire young generation now that didn't care about cable, that has grown up with video on the internet, that is accustomed to seeing you know, somewhat badly produced videos on YouTube, but that also, and I know this hasn't come up yet, but that engages in downloading video that often is not authorized, otherwise known in some cases as piracy. <laughs> and I went and told this large media corporation, um, this was an internal event, all about the websites that are out there where my students would go online and they would, within 45 minutes of the show airing, be able to access that show in sometimes HD quality. 
And I said to them, I said, well, why don't you make your videos available online, you know, without DRM and, a, and with a subscription such that these students would be willing to pay, you know, a reasonable amount per month. And they told me, well, the cable companies would never accept that because they would threaten to take away, you know, the large amounts of revenue. Uh, so as a result, I said to them, well, people will continue to do this and continue to pirate your shows until you make them available in a meaningful way that people would actually be willing to, you know, that 20 something year olds would pay for and they just saw it as, you know, they weren't willing to do so or the cable companies weren't willing to let them do so. Was it, um, was it, was it Al Franken who like recently said something, uh, something along the lines of, I'm paraphrasing it hor horribly, but um, you know, essentially uh, uh, cable companies, telecoms, they're all in the business of trying to freeze the internet uh, where that it is sounds now, like something you'd say, and to keep it from you know keep it from going anywhere, right? Um, the it's amazing how much you know. As Abner said, you know, uh, uh, and there's a bunch of people in this room who all know that this isn't a technology issue, right? Um, if you actually look at the if you actually look at the at the, at the actual structure of broadcast. Right. There's a reason why cable works the way that it does, right? One head end sending out to multiple homes all over, you know, all, all within the municipality, right? And then now you have a system that's completely peer-to-peer. -peer. The actual network itself is so different than what's come before, and yet we're yet we have these we have these large entities that have so much invested in the old form that they're willing to ignore the way that consumers are using it, which is the thing that scares me about the consumer thing, right? Um, but then of uh, they're they're able to they have so much money that they're able to continue pouring on everything from DRM to closed networks like you know closed ecosystems like iTunes et cetera et cetera in order to to try to maintain that advantage in order to freeze the internet you know at that one place. Well, let's talk about uh, you know requ system requirements, if you will. You know, our house we sort of met one of them. We actually have very good over the air reception. I use I think it costs. 12, possibly $13 for the actual set of rabbit ears we have uh, on, on the windowsill next to the TV downstairs. Uh, one thing we did have to do, though, is upgrade our internet connection. I had an old DSL service that was only 1.5, not nearly fast enough. We got Verizon Fios. Speed is not a problem anymore. Um, to what extent, though, is that kind of bandwidth need going to be a problem, either for people who live further out from a city or perhaps they only have one company that doesn't do it very well or reliably? Um, or they simply they have a service that's technically broadband but not fast enough for video. I, I want to give something that I think is related but also uh, further what Kenyatta was saying in that I think that the danger is, is even worse than freezing the internet where it is now. I think there's actually a danger of the internet becoming more like the cable companies. Um, and you mentioned Apple and, and we're really concerned that that's what Apple is trying to do basically is become the new cable, the new mainstream gatekeeper. Um, and, and I mentioned that because I think that that links in strongly two system requirements, I think that uh, when you have cable companies owning the same uh, infrastructure for the internet, they want that to happen, uh, or they have an interest in that happening. I also uh, want to make the point that this is an area in which the U.S. is now lagging behind. If you go elsewhere around the world, you will have 100 megabit uh, internet connections as the norm, right? In Sweden, um, that's what you get in your home for any average customer. Um, there's significantly more competition in the broadband space elsewhere. And unfortunately, here in the US, you will often only have one, or maybe if you're lucky, two options. And the broadband is not nearly what it is elsewhere. So this worries me from a global perspective that we are now significantly lagging behind. I'd ask the Post to send me to Sweden to research that properly, but I, I don't think they're going to do it at this point. <laughs> Um, uh, do you, does everyone know the story of how the how the studio system came to be in LA, or came to actually be in LA? They were trying to actually uh, escape the patent issues with um, what, was, was it Thomas Edison? Yeah. Frickin' Thomas Edison. Uh, but they're trying to escape the patent issues of trying to set up shop uh, on the East Coast. Um, if they actually try to create uh, 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 essentially a studio to, in order to, to, to make um, moving pictures, then um, the, then the Edison, Edison folks would go after them. And so the idea was, well, let's get as far away from them as we can. Of course, it's sunnier there and everything else. But let's get as far away from them as we can to escape their jurisdiction. 
And so this entire studio system sets up in, um, in Southern California um, uh, to in order to escape what had come before. Um, I can't help but wonder, you know, Mega Video, who someone mentioned earlier, I think, um, is based out of what, Hong Kong? Right? I'm wondering if we're going to end up seeing uh, more sort of video hosting networks that are aren't afraid to let video go up 45 minutes after it, it uh, has its first air, um, that aren't afraid of uh, WIPO or that, you know, aren't afraid of, of, of copyright altogether, and they end up becoming the primary providers because, because you know, we suck. <laughs> and I think that's that's dangerous, not just from a, a, a nationalist perspective or a corporate perspective, but also because that ends up tailoring to what's the most popular and what gets the most hits. And one of the things that is almost commendable about the traditional cable system is that it was trying to support more niche markets by bundling channels. And I think that we have to watch out for um, losing some of those markets that we're really interested in, for example, like public access television um, and other educational Im informational content um, if we go to a system like that. Let's talk about, uh, let's sort of, did we all get a, in a, a word in on that topic? Good, okay, I'm not keeping score, so. Um, let's talk about, you know, move on from bandwidth issues to content issues. Um, the sports came up before, and, and I agree, regional blackouts are ridiculous. Um, you know, I, I can't watch the Nets online at home in D.C., but I can certainly tune in to watch the Sox or any other city's baseball team. Which of the major sports leagues do you think is, is going to be the first to crumble? Who, who, would, who seems most likely to say, you know what, if you, the viewer, want to pay us to watch our, watch our stuff, We'll let you. Crazy thought, I know. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I think it's just probably going to be one of the extremes. It's either very small leagues, which I think is already happening, or it's going to be someone that can afford to do that, like you know NFL. <coughs> and NFL today, you know, they're offering a pretty aggressive package together with Directv for three fifty. You don't have to be a Directv subscriber. Uh, I I pay three fifty a year for NFL. We're, we're talking NFL Sunday ticket. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So you can watch most of the games um, online without having a cable subscription. But still, it's billions of dollars that they get paid by yeah, the broadcast. They, on, they only started doing internet-only Sunday ticket sales uh, earlier this year, as I recall. Yep. yep. Um, so I, I think that's that's going to happen, and the model is probably just going to be uh, the reason for it to happen is that you'll have a critical mass of consumers, whether those are people under 30 using Xbox or Boxy or you know, Roku or Google TV or whatever. There's just, you know, millions of people that have connected devices in their living room with credit cards willing to pay to watch the content. And at a certain point, if you're an executive, you're saying, you know, there's all this money on the table that we're leaving, you know, we need to figure out a model that we can serve them. Um, and I think that's bound to happen. It's a matter of time. You know, some people will tell you three years, some people will tell you 10 years, but it's gonna happen. And what's gonna drive it, I don't think is gonna be public policy. I think it's gonna be actually consumers. Are other sports fans here? Kenyatta? Yeah, what, what, yeah what, how, do you, how do you feel about it? Uh, about sports, regional blackouts? Yeah. I think they're a dumb idea. I mean, you know, I'm willing to pay. I'm not asking to, to see every Nats game for free. Um, I, I don't see the point in it. And I would think especially in, in D.C. I don't know how many folks we have from the D.C. area here. Uh, the Nats were originally the Expos. They came to town in 2005. And for the first year, no one carried their regional sports <coughs> network. Major League Baseball set up a new company called Mid-Atlantic Sports Network, basically to, to bribe Peter Angelos, the owner of the Baltimore Orioles. I think DirecTV carried it and nobody. So my wife and I, like a lot of people, listen to games on the radio. You know, we're the sports fans of 1950. And the Nats have a very good radio crew, and that's how we still watch it, because there's one game on Sunday that's over the air. Uh, and I would think of, of anybody, Masson, would be aggressive in this because their audience numbers historically have been bad. Uh, even now, Dish Network doesn't carry their high definition, uh, their high definition broadcast. It's only standard def. Uh, I know that there are some. I think the uh, Padres Regional Sports Network does let people watch online in that area. Yeah, They're an exception. Padres and Yankees right. uh, done the year uh, 18 months ago, but it requires you to be a cable subscriber. Yeah, the bundling deal. Yeah. So you, let, let's get into that, actually. One of the, uh, it seems right now, the, the major response of cable companies to this allegedly non-existent threat 
is these triple play bundles, which seem like a great deal. Uh, they must be because uh, people must like them because Comcast and Verizon have probably sent 200 pounds of flyers to our house over the last three years, each touting their competing bundles and each misleading in their own way since they never tell you what the price will be after the first year or six months. Although if you're my neighbor David, if you ever need somebody to negotiate for you, you should get this guy. Uh, he, he's been paying the intro rate for Comca to Comcast for about two years, three years. <laughs> he's very good at calling and saying, yeah, I think I'm going to leave. You just uh, have to be disciplined about calling them every three months right. saying you're going to leave. And so they offer these bundles of voice, internet, and TV. Uh, and they have all sorts of interesting contract provisions. To, to what extent is this either confusing or trapping people into paying for TV when they might not? Yeah, it's, uh, I, I think it's numbing the consumer a little bit. Because you're saying, I just want, you know, I just want broadband. I don't care about wireline phone and some people don't care about the video subscription but they say listen it's the same rather than pay you know 99 bucks for uh internet and video we'll give you internet video and phone and then a year later it's 180 bucks but you know you forgot to call them and you presumably don't you're your having phone. it billed to your credit card automatically right. anyways exactly so uh, i think a lot of consumers are at that point where they're saying to one of the services listen i'm not interested but the offer is it's going to be cheaper for you if you take the three of them but then after a while it expires, it becomes more expensive. So it's, you know, it's a marketing ploy. At the end, consumers are, you can't rely on consumer being stupid for so long, you know? So at the end, people will wake up to it. And I, you know, I today, I, I pay a hundred bucks a month, but I pay only for broadband. I get a hundred megabit where I live and, um, and that's it. It's 99 bucks. There's no additional cost. And I'm, you know, I, I have Skype. I don't need a wireline phone. I have over the air antenna and Netflix. I don't need, you know, cable service um, and I'm still paying them a hundred bucks so they should be happy and I, I think many consumers will be willing to pay you know a good amount of money for a great quality of service on their broadband connection just you know don't bundle it with all that other stuff uh, that's a marketing thing more than anything else I was just say I think that something that they have learned to do really well that we need to to watch out for or learn from is being really clear to people about what do you get and how and where do you get it um, I think a lot of times it can just be the, the familiarity of, oh, it comes through my television, it's just there when I turn it on, that, I get that. Um, and so I think that we as a, as a community that are interested in these new models need to be careful about having a very clear pitch for how our products work, for how our models work, um, and how we can, can build them together. I saw someone on Twitter say, when will my parents be able to use this? Um, and my parents just cut the cord the, a couple months ago. Um, but I, I've been a little bit sad because so far they, I think, haven't reached out as much as they can. And I think that that's because we need to find ways to work together as a community to, to make those pitches. Kids, point out to your parents that, you know, this is your inheritance at stake, so they should <laughs> cut costs where they can. Elizabeth, do you want to add on that? Okay. So another aspect of uh, broadband, you know, uh, nice speed is good, but some of these services come with broadband caps. To what extent, you know, is Com Comcast has a 250 gigabyte allowance, and I actually know someone who's exceeded it, who's testing a lot of online backup software. How low do one of these caps have to get before it makes cord cutting a, a financially punitive situation because you're either getting charged more or threatened with disconnection. I, I feel like I'm hogging the microphone. Um, Th this is your app. This is you. Right, yeah. Th yeah. That's true. Um, I'll ignore you later on. That's okay. <laughs> so I, I think we're not at the point yet that they see cord cutting as such a huge threat that they're going to start and, and optimize those caps towards video. Um, and they definitely see stuff like Netflix as a, as a threat. And, you know, if you've seen some of the actually um, backbone uh, carriage deals, there you, you start to see some uh, muscles being used uh, around there, but not with consumers yet, around applications. But without net neutrality to protect the consumer, I think when it becomes really serious and it's starting to threaten um, real dollars and every conference call, it's not 200,000 subscribers that left, but it's, you know, you know, it's a million subscribers that left. I think without net neutrality to protect it, I think the online video services, there is a chance that they're gonna come under attack. One of them could be, you know, those, uh, those type of caps or just degrading quality of service of video saying, you know what, 
Uh, if you want to watch HD video over the web, you need to pay extra because you know it costs us so much and whatever. So I think it could definitely happen. To prevent it from happening, we just need more competition. Either a model like Europe, where if you're an infrastructure provider, you have to wholesale your infrastructure, so anybody can offer broadband. And then if you're not, you know, if your interests are not uh, aligned with with video, you can still be aggressive. I think that's one way to solve it from the business side, and the other way is net neutrality being, uh, you know, really forceful. I actually wanted to comment on a related issue, um, namely the asymmetrical nature of broadband connections. Um, here in the U.S. generally, even if you have a high amount of bandwidth downstream, you're going to have a much lower amount upstream. Um, I just found some numbers where apparently in Sweden, you can get both 100 megabit up and downstream for $46 a month. Can you imagine that? I, w I want that. Maybe I should move to Sweden. Um, whereas in the US, generally speaking, um, even if you would have something like 50 megs up, you're going to have 20 down for $145. And that even sounds like a good deal to me. Uh, in what I, it of course depends upon one's region and, and where one's located and what the providers are willing to offer. But that said, having that asymmetrical connection means that if you wanted to upload video, which a lot of video creators are going to want to do, or even serve video, um, there's a significant barrier to doing so. So thinking about how elsewhere in the world people have these symmetrical connections that facilitate the creation and distribution of online video, and here in the US we don't necessarily have that. To me that's a related and important issue. Well, the policy issue is interesting here though because I was at the FCC panel earlier, and it doesn't seem like this FCC is very interested in, in being too aggressive in regulations. You know, they, they went for the, the least <laughs> intrusive, least assertive form of net neutrality regulation, and, and now they, they seem worried that that's going too far. So, you know, that's one area where we, I don't know, we may have to hope that Verizon and, and uh, Comcast hate each other enough to provide some decent competition in, in broadband for the home. I wanted to get... Well, I, I could just tell a story. Um, so Avner mentioned the regulations that they have in Sweden and in other countries. Uh, and the regulations, we don't have them here, so it's kind of hard to, to, to envision them. But, but imagine back when we had like dial-up, where you could dial-up AOL or Earthlink or net, you know, net Zero, and you didn't have to use your actual like Verizon to be your ISP. Any of those companies could offer services over the top of the network. In Sweden or Japan, an independent provider like Yahoo Japan can come in and rent parts of the network and then put in new, faster technologies and provide you internet service over the Japanese telecom company's network. And so that would provide competition. The traditional telecom company would have to upgrade their technology. And you'd have all these different competitors over one network. And that resulted in 100 megabit connections, lower prices, and lots of companies that weren't cable companies that didn't have an incentive in interfering with online TV. Right? So, so that's the model they have there, competition in services. And this FCC was asked by Congress to have a national broadband plan. You know, let's have a national broadband plan because as it turns out, we're 15th in the world. Like, you know, I think we were behind Lithuania. Uh, or Latvia, when it comes to speeds, when it comes to penetration, when it comes to prices. Uh, and I, I, you know, I'm, I can't remember the exact numbers, but in Japan you could get you know, connections 10 times faster for like a quarter of the price at a certain time. And so they got this guy uh, at Harvard named Yokai Benkler, one of the great scholars, he spoke here yesterday, to do a, a sort of literature study and report as to you know, what are the factors that have made us fall behind the rest of the world. And he said, you know, one of the main factors is that we don't have these policies, these kinds of competition over the wire policies. We don't have them here. We should consider them in our national broadband plan. And when our FCC got them, got that report from, you know, the Harvard Berkman Center, uh, the FCC immediately buried the report, ran away from it, uh, and their defense when they were finally asked about it was, well, there's no political support for that kind of aggressive regulation. And by political support, they meant you know, AT&T, Comcast, the companies that we should be regulating don't want to be regulated in that manner. I can't believe it. Uh, I mean, it's, it's like asking <coughs> Iran what sanctions we should impose on them. Right? And so, uh, so that's why we don't have those rules, and we might not anytime soon. And so in light of the fact 
and we have a pretty pretty wimpy FCC. You know, there, there's a whole range of different rules uh, that could be used. I'm not sure if they would be, but the, the cable companies, uh, you know, they might target online TV with bandwidth caps. They might do outright blocking, you know, which net neutrality would respond to. They have a lot of ways of trying to tie content to their own packages to make it impossible to watch online TV without getting a cable package. Uh, and all of these are different methods that they have. And what you would need is an aggressive regulator, you know, with the public over, overseeing them to actually manage all of these different little tricks they have to try to get at online TV. Can, can I ask a, a question um, about the, someone actually, well, I want to ask someone this, someone's question from Twitter, from a tweet. Uh, uh, someone brought, brought up a good point of, you know, we're kind of painting uh, the sort of unbundled utopia, right, of, of being a cord cutter, right? But uh, of course, we all know that once you, know, once you have that in place, there's a whole new set of problems that, that come into play. Um, what are the problems that actually come into play if we actually have if we actually have a place where where boxy is the greatest and 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 the greatest uh, uh, content uh, um, uh, set top box uh, uh, in the world and um, I'm no longer having to use a closed you know just the closed uh, uh, app store and um, what else happens like what else happens in terms of policy what else happens in terms of like community access in terms of um you know, one of the questions on my list is, in fact, about app stores and, you know, on mobile devices, you know, the pretty much none of the, the established cord cutting sites work in their browsers. If you're lucky, you've got an Android tablet and you can download the Flash player that's not included and then start watching if it, you know, doesn't slow down the thing too much. So we, cord cutting becomes an app phenomenon on a lot of mobile devices and also on a lot of these web media receivers. You know, obviously, if you connect a computer to your TV, you can watch anything you want from anywhere, and you know the sites can't do anything about it. Uh, but sites can and, and will do things like block Google TV from access, and so therefore you have to get an app onto it, and it becomes this business transaction. Um, how big of a problem do you think this is going to be, and, and is there any sort of sound policy response you can do that is, is not going to raise all sorts of other issues? I, I think it's a big problem, um, and I think that what we're seeing, I mean, even if you have an Android tablet, if you've gotten your media through iTunes, you can't get it on your tablet. So I think that it's something to be really concerned about, and I, um, I think that there are policy solutions, but I also think that we can try to really support the, the most open ecosystem that we can find and not just kind of rush to, oh, I really want to watch this show. What's the, the easiest way for me to watch it? Oh, I heard this one. Let me go with that. Um, but really learn from what the challenges that we're facing now, um, both with cable and with cord cutting, and try to build a better ecosystem for the future. And I, I hope that uh, we're trying to do that with, with PCF and with Miro. Um, and I think that it's really critical to keep those issues in mind when you're looking for entertainment and media. I also think this is a, a very complicated and multi-layered scenario, right? Because you have Steve Jobs over at Apple, well, he's kind of there right now, um, who does, he's fighting against Adobe and Flash and does not want Flash on his hardware. He stated publicly that Flash is responsible for m many of the crashes on the Mac OS or even it's not available on the iOS. But he's pushing for adoption of H.264, which is actually a patented um, video codec. And we don't need to get into the specifics of, right, it's closed, right? Um, it is proprietary. It's not open. Um, so when Steve has this significant amount of control, as a result, people that are producing video on Flash-based platforms cannot have their video on the iOS devices. Now, if we had more open alternatives like we at the Open Video Alliance have promoted, such as Og Theora, or now more recently WebM, which is an open video standard um, that Google, Mozilla, and others are promoting, um, Steve Jobs, believe it or not, can actually control what codecs would be supported on the iOS. Um, so you have this gatekeeping scenario. Um, if it's a strategic, move for Apple, they might opt to include that on their machines. But Steve ultimately has the capability to deny any app from its app store. Have people heard about what happened with VLC and the iOS app store? 
Um, so VLC is a very popular open source under the GPL license uh, online video player. And as it turns out, the, the rules of the App Store are such that they are in conflict with the open source uh, GPL license, free and open source software. Um, so one of the, I believe it was one of the contributors to the VLC project wrote to Apple pointing out this discrepancy and Apple removed VLC from the App Store. Does anyone know what, is it back up or is it? It was back up. Um, but basically, you have this scenario where you have gatekeepers that can just, at a whim, decide you know, what technological innovation is allowed and what innovation is not allowed. And this is incredibly dangerous when it comes to free speech and free expression online. The other way you can sort of tie up content online, of course, is through various financial deals. It's been very interesting to see how Netflix has both you know, been the victim of some of these politics, and then I, I have here a, a question on Twitter noting that you know, hey, now the only way I can watch Mad Men online is, is through Netflix. To, to what extent, you know, have we seen the, the worst of this or is it only going to get worse as, you know, the movie studios, they really, really love this, to me, stupid release window model. And there's a lot of ways that seems to constrain what shows up online. You know, you have the crazy case where, you know, the movie you want won't be on Netflix until a month from now, then it'll vanish from it two months later uh, you know, what, what do you think is next in Hollywood's bag of tricks? Considering that so far these people don't seem to think that they could make more money by making it easier for me, the viewer, to pay them. I, I think actually the worst example is if, if you buy a movie, you actually purchase the movie <laughs> from an online service that is stored in the cloud, once that movie goes on HBO, you can't access the copy that you bought. That's kind of uh, insane. If you download it to your local storage, you can watch it. But if you store it online, you can't watch it. Um, but those things, I, I think, are going to go away. I mean, today, many of, con of the con major content owners see the internet as a threat. I think we're not far away from that, them seeing it as a huge opportunity. It's like the same way that media companies were afraid of you know, TVs, and they were afraid of VCRs, and they were afraid of DVDs, and they were afraid from ca of cable. You know, the knee-jerk reaction is always concern because it breaks a business model that is usually, you know, very, very good. But I think the internet actually offers great models. Like if I'm at home and there is a movie that just went out to the theaters, I may be willing to pay 30 or 50 or whatever uh, amount to watch that movie at my home right now at the same time that it went to the theaters. And I think you've s you're seeing some of those, that experimentation going with the smaller studios. I think it's going to reach the bigger ones. Uh, and I think that you'll always be in an environment where somebody is paying for exclusivity to attract subscribers. And I, I think that's fine. Uh, I think that's you know, just normal, normal business. What you don't want is you don't want a situation like kind of exists today where you have a fourth method, uh, reliable method of distribution of content, which is the internet, that wants to compete with cable and satellite and IPTV, but can't get a fair chance because it's discriminated against. That's not cool, but if it gets to play on a you know level playing field, I think the internet will be able to compete very well, and I think from business models uh, standpoint, it's going to be the best business models ever are going to be on the internet. So I think you'll hear media companies drooling over the internet and what it offered them to do in terms of monetizations and building franchises. Five years from now, from now, the biggest media business is going to be like a franchise, like CSI, whatever, is going to be online, in my opinion rather than on traditional TV. And that's what's going to drive this industry. I, I think it's also, I, I, I don't want to trivialize the importance of being able to access the Hollywood content and the mainstream content. Um, but I also think that these structural um, issues concern me because of being able to access independent content and alternative content. And I think that that uh, growing body of content can also be seen as a threat to a lot of different of the, the uh, major mainstream players. So I think that that also needs to be remembered at when we're talking about the structural level of what's accessible through a, a particular media um, distributor, um, is that the, the Hollywood people, they might drool over it, but I think we have to be scared of that drool a little bit and, and where that might take us, because they can afford to figure out a system that won't support uh, all, the, all the diversity of media that we want to see. I'm actually optimistic. I think today we live in a world where 
you know, you either do a very, you know, cheap to produce um, web video that is very hard to monetize and build a real business on, or you're building like this big franchise on traditional cable or broadcast. And in the middle, there is like nothingness. And I think the internet is going to offer the ability for a lot of stuff to appear in, in the middle. So, and I don't think Hollywood will be able to block it. And Hollywood is facing <coughs> a much more competitive landscape. They are concerned about that. Because now I can watch something from Ted for 30 minutes rather than watch a TV show. And I can watch something on YouTube rather than, than watch their show. And, you know, this content is getting better. And users have only, you know, one brain so they can watch only one thing. At well, most people can watch only one <laughs> thing at one time. And, and that's competition for Hollywood. And when, when stuff like Miro or Boxy or others m make it like for a user as easy to get a web show as it is to get a TV show, that's, that's scary for traditional media. And I don't think there's any getting away from it. And you know, they also compete with Angry Birds. You know, if I go on a flight, right, I can choose to pay two bucks for Angry Birds or 10 bucks for five episodes of something. And in many cases, people choose Angry Birds. That's also competition. So I, I think the, the playing field is much more wide now, and there's going to be more and more competition. So it's going to get more difficult for them, and I think it's going to get much better for the independent content producers. That, that's what I hope as well, and that's what I want to sort of uh, get into now. We had the example before of how when things started getting interesting in Egypt, you know, I, I knew to sort of go to Al Jazeera English's website. I don't know they would have automatically done that when I was a cable subscriber because it would be so much easier just to get the remote. Well, then again, I'd have to find CNN on the program grid and maybe not. Um, so to what extent does cord cutting, you know, get people interested and exposed to more of these diverse sources? At what point will, you know, step two on a video startups checklist not be get me on Comcast standard bundle, whatever you have to do? I mean, for some sites, it's, it's already not the case. I assume Rocket Boom never had that in its business plan, right? No. Get cable carriage. Uh, no, it did. It did. I mean, it, it. You know, it has. It. What's great about being an independent is that, and not being tied to a particular. Like, I'm not. We we never play the, uh, God bless you, uh, uh, PBS. But we never play the like. The the, the PBS distribution lottery of oh my god I, we're going to spend our entire year working on this one freaking documentary and hope that PBS shows it one night right um, we're not going to um, uh, we 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 didn't want to go through any of the traditional routes because we knew that there was something to being able to stay sort of platform neutral uh, but also be able to deal with the licensing in a way where no matter if we if for some odd reason Abner came to us and said hey we want to put the Rock Boom app front and center, and we want to make it exclusive. Like, he, well, he's never, he's not stupid enough to actually ask us to do that. Or mm -hmm. rich enough. Or rich enough. <laughs> but, um, uh, but there are other folks who, you know, when we would talk to cable companies, they would, they would say, um, hey, we want to turn, turn what you're doing into a 30-minute show. Um, but in order to do it, we want you to take it off the internet. No, that's stupid. It doesn't make any sense, right? Um, there's a... Uh, um, and so there's this, uh, there's this constant battle where, where it makes it hard for, actually someone had said on Twitter earlier asking about what it means for independent producers. Um, it makes it kind of hard because the large companies want you to do those exclusive deals. And they'll, they'll, they'll dangle what seems like a really nice paycheck in front of you, but it has so many strings attached that it keeps you from doing anything else. And all of a sudden, you find yourself with it. Like, it's like quicksand. All of a sudden, you find yourself within that ecosystem, and you can't get out. Um, trying to find you know, where that balance is um, is kind of hard. Uh, when you look at something like Next New, actually, do you want to talk about Next New? OK, I'll talk about Next New. <laughs> uh, take a look at Next New Networks, which, um, uh, which is an independent production company um, of was independent. was an independent production company was was sort of the shining beacon for for at least my industry like and, and a lot of us in this room um, they get you know purchased by Google and they're still doing good work but th being within that context of Google possibly changes what they do and how they do it and so you have to wonder you know is you know does that mean just mean that Google becomes uh, um, in in this sort of good versus evil battle that we're setting up here right do they become part of that other side, um, or are they still fighting for the Rebel Alliance? And one quick comment about Next New, but they, I believe, initially started where they were more of an in-house production company where they produced their own shows and then shifted to a model where they then set up rev share deals with people that were making their own shows. 
And I believe it was the latter that actually ended up making them quite a bit of ad revenue and money, which made them very attractive to YouTube, who then ultimately acquired them via Google. Yeah. So that may have been a, a significant shift in, in the model there. And, and, and that, I mean, that's only say that, okay, there's a market there for that, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, part of it is that you may, you know, yes, you can look at it and, 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 and do the dark side, <laughs> like kind of like framework for it, but also it's, hey, wait a second, maybe that means that this stuff that we've all been doing for, for so long actually does have a place within that ecosystem, especially if, um, especially if, if, if it becomes this, this sort of level playing field that we're all talking about. So, there's so many ifs. There's so many ifs. <laughs> if, if, it's crazy. If, exactly, yes. But I, I think it's absolutely already happening. Um, I was just looking at an example let me pull up here, of uh, Nina Paley, who did uh, Sita Sings the Blues, which is this incredible uh, mm. film remix. And, and she talks in this blog post about her decision to not stream on Netflix, um, which was based on the fact that all Netflix content uses DRM. And she felt like it came along with all of these uh, restrictions on the people who were viewing her content that she just couldn't support. Um, so I think that people are starting to step up, and, and I think we also see that model in the book industry, where people are starting to bypass certain uh, publishing houses and just go straight to their viewers. Okay, I wanted to sort of now get into, you know, at what point will we know this is, when is the cable company going to do a few, few things right now considered uh, <coughs> heresy? So first off, Will cord cutting at any point get them to finally start selling channels a la carte? Yes, you, you just pay for the channels you want. Is this something that, will we ever see this happen? No. <laughs> Actually, it, can, I, can I tack a second, a part two onto that? I just want to tack a part two onto that for anyone who's going to answer, which is what does that mean for, for things like community access? A la carte is something that is not just the cable industry is resisting. It's also the media companies are resisting because the existing model is is great for both sides. If you're a media company, you can you can get paid in a way that doesn't is not tied to performance. And for a bunch of channels, a couple of them may do well, but you know some of them may do very very bad. But you're getting paid very nicely for it. And if you're a cable company, you bundle and you get a much higher ARPU. So it's like uh, it's. Average revenue per user. Yeah, it's a mutually beneficial arrangement that both of them don't have the motivation to actually embark on. I think cable companies would not be that afraid from um, from a la carte. Actually, I think it has a much bigger impact on the way media, you know, like the Hollywood content is being produced. I think it's inevitable that it's going to happen, and again, it's going to be driven by consumers. If I'm going to pay, you know, eight bucks to Netflix. And then I have, rather than paying 80 bucks, so I have 72 bucks that now I save, and I'm willing to spend on the stuff I like, and there's gonna be enough of us, then I think they'll have to offer us their content. Otherwise, you know, they'll be losing subscribers. HBO lost a bunch of subscribers last year. You know, this trend is gonna continue if they're not gonna start offering their content to the consumer. And, and a la carte is the only um, way that this would work. I'm not saying, sub, you know, bundling is gonna go away. It's, it's going to remain, and it's going to be fine for many consumers. But for many others, a la carte will be, will be the model. But it has, it will have huge impact on the way the media companies are structured. They'll have to be more vertically integrated, so they'll have to produce more of their content to be viable, because the value is going to switch more towards the content owner. And some channels that today are doing very well, I think, are just going to go bankrupt because there's not enough people watching them, and they can't cover for the loss of subscription fees with advertising. And some of the public access channels also will have a hard time just, but they'll be competing with everybody. Because you compete with this other guy on YouTube that is producing a show once a day or once a week. And now it's becoming a discovery channel. You know, do you use Miro Guide and how does Miro Guide surface content to me? Or how does Apple surface content to me? And how search works? And when I'm just vegetating in front of the TV, how do I get exposed to content? All of those things will be figured out, and there's going to be lo losers and going to be winners. On the winner column, I'll put the user and anybody that makes great content. And on the losing side, I would put some of the traditional companies, and anybody that is making crappy content is going to have a crappy business. 
Um, I talk to a lot of public access stations and a lot of um, local content producers, and I think that there's a lot of fear about what you're talking about, that this, uh, that the end of cable will mean the end of public access. And I think that uh, it's important to not tie the two just because their funding models have traditionally been tied. I think there's actually a lot of opportunity with cord cutting, with moving online, um, as long as we protect these open systems, for people to develop even stronger local media um, alliances and uh, uh, groups and production spaces. Um, and I think it's just, it's also uh, in part uh, important for the, the public access stations themselves to recognize that they need to not just hold on for dear life to the cable, but to embrace these open systems and the opportunities that it offers them. Uh, I just want to address the second part of the question, which I know is a question I ask. I didn't want to set this up for me to talk. But um, uh, if you're working in traditional peg and you're tied to the success of the cable system because you're so worried about uh, maintaining your existing model, you will die, period. Um, if you realize that uh, the cable company was just a way to be able to get, uh, get funding, and you realize that you have a mission that doesn't, doesn't care if you're a 501c3 or if you're an LLC or L3c or anything in between, um, then you have, you have a chance. If you actually embrace this technology and you, talk to, and you decide to come up here and talk to these two afterwards, then you have a chance. Otherwise, you're dead. Marvin, you were looking a little skeptical before. Do you want to? Uh, okay. okay, yeah. It certainly can seem, seems to me that if you get into a universe where a la carte becomes a reality, that that, if anything, would accelerate the movement of video to the web. Because if you're a niche cable channel and you're no longer automatically on the program guide, even if you're, you know, 10 screens down, channel 628, uh, you know, you'd better have a video strategy so people who are interested in your stuff can go find it without having to get through the cable UI first. Actually, I, I'm not skeptical, but I'm, I'm more pessimistic than, than some others. So uh, I do think that the cable companies, like the Comcast you know, and the, the phone companies and the, and the satellite companies, will fight tooth and nail to try to ensure that you're paying them you know, every month for internet and then every month for TV. Right? That way they get paid twice. Right? They don't want you just paying them one time for internet. And the way the model works right now is that they charge you for internet a certain amount, then they charge you for cable TV, and then they take some of the money you pay them for cable TV. Don't forget the overpriced phone service, too. Yeah, over, sure, overpriced phone service. Uh, we'll leave that out for now. Uh, and then for the cable TV, they, they take some of that money, and then they pay the content guys, Hollywood, right? They pay ESPN, they pay for the content, they pay for uh, Comedy Central, all of those guys. So those people who they're paying Right? They try to bribe them, as Kenyatta mentioned. They try to say, we will stop paying you all this money if you take your channel, if you take your content and put it on the internet. Because then if you do that, people will stop paying Comcast the TV, the TV price. Right? So the, the challenge for consumers, right, it's, it's probably easier to watch TV through cable. Right? It's already connected to your TV. You, just, you have a remote, you flip channels, and there's stuff there and there's on demand. So it's still easier for a lot of people <laughs> to watch TV over the air, you know, over cable. And the cable system, the cable companies like Comcast have, and Time Warner Cable have watched what has happened in other parts of the entertainment industry because of the internet. Right? They've seen what happened to music. They've seen that the music companies didn't put their content online, which was might maybe a, a would have would have worked, except there was all this piracy out there. And now they, that now they see the same thing happening on TV. They see all this piracy out there. And so instead of rushing to get their content out because they're afraid that they'll lose money, like the music industry may have lost money, what they want to do is they want to find a way to lock it up and to say, fine, you get, you get to watch TV channels online as long as you also pay for cable TV. Right? So essentially, they'd be the offerer of online TV, but it would only be available if you also paid for cable, so you'd pay them twice as well. And they have this whole industry-wide system they call TV Everywhere, and Comcast calls it Xfinity Online or something. <coughs> and this is a way to try to make sure that, at the very least, if you watch TV online, you're also paying them to, to watch cable TV. Right? So you, get, you pay them twice. So they're, they're going to they're gonna fight as hard as they can. And the interesting thing about this is that they haven't even worked out a lot of the, the business models. Right? Time Warner Cable now makes it possible for you to watch 
channels, not only on the TV screen, but also on your iPad, right, that they can now stream it to your iPad. And when they did that, the content companies in Hollywood said, wait a second, Time Warner Cable, you don't have the rights to do that. And that's exactly how Hollywood thinks. Yeah. And so they're still working the system up, but they want to figure out a way to keep the pie big enough for all of them where, as he mentioned, you know, Viacom and all these cable, cable channels get paid every month some per subscriber fee by Comcast, and Comcast gets paid twice by you, once for broadband, once for, for TV. And uh, I'm usually pretty optimistic, but uh, this guy, Tim Wu, who used to be a Free Press's chairman, wrote a book that's a history of the communications industries. And you see throughout that you have some, you know, radical innovations that take off, and you have some that are destroyed in the grave and take, you know, 40 years to come back. Like, you know, FM radio was invented in the 30s, and it wasn't until the 70s or 80s that it actually took off because the AM guys had sort of stifled it. And so I think there will be um, a challenge going forward. Uh, you know, and I, I do think that, you know, consumer education might be the, the most important step. You know, it's, you know the, new, the news channels aren't going to report this. And so I think people talking to each other about it and sort of passing the word on the internet and, and in meetings will go a long way. Uh, Elizabeth, and then we'll, we'll take some questions from you all. Uh, sure. I just wanted to briefly uh, chime in about TV Everywhere. Um, so when I was invited to debate this um, big media uh, executive, I brought up the point that if you're going to ask in a generation of people you know, that have cut the cord, that have grown up these digital natives, so to speak. This is a term used for, you know, people that have had the internet for as long as they can remember. The idea that they have to subscribe to cable when they often don't even have a TV in order to watch TV on the internet just seems completely preposterous to me as somebody in that situation and to many other of these people. So with regard to the idea of a la carte, to me, unless you can pay a la carte to watch TV on the internet, and you don't have to be a, an in-house cable subscriber. I just don't see that working. And the alternatives are, frankly, that a lot of people will still engage in piracy, and we can talk about the merits maybe if people want to discuss that in the question and answer session. But particularly this young generation that's technologically savvy, these people will find other ways to access the content, right? Can I, can I say one more thing, actually? So when you think of a la carte, that's sort of the idea that uh, you pay for the, the channels you want. You know, I only watch ABC and HBO or whatever, right? I can only pay for those two. But even that is kind of a bundle. Like on the internet, a la, if it was actually a la carte, I only watch really, you know, um, Entourage, uh, right? I and mean, that's all <laughs> I watch on HBO. I want to pay for just Entourage. And you can, you, you can not only cut out the, the middleman of the cable company packaging channels, but also of the channel packaging different programs. And I mean, so, so you know, I think a lot of people, young people especially, are moving towards the model of just paying for the shows they want. You know, and that's, if we can move towards that model, I think a lot of people would be very happy. Uh, but there, there is, a, you know, there would be ramifications, but I think that's what the ultimate a la carte will be. And I, I think that this movement that we're talking about also has to come from, and does come from producers as well as consumers. I think that the more that uh, there are new independent producers who are um, interested in, in accessing audience and aren't that interested in the idea of the cable industry, um, they're developing new models and they're resisting models that are really going to limit their creativity and who they can access, um, whether that's Nina Pele refusing Netflix um, or folks who are deciding to get funding through things like Kickstarter um, or direct crowdfunding. I think that producers really have a role to play in this new model and, and in staving off that pessimism. For Traditional TV content today, um, I mean, there's two places that uh, gather most of users' attention legally. Um, one is uh, Hulu, which is um, owned by NBC, Fox, and uh, Disney, you know, majority owned. And they get, you know, they get rights to stream those shows uh, after a certain time have passed from those shows, shows being on air. And, um, and then they monetize through advertising. Or if you want to watch it on your iPad or your mobile device or your TV, you have to pay a subscription in order to access essentially the same content. So for many users online, uh, watching a TV show online is synonymous with going to Hulu. You can go to the network sites directly, to NBC, ABC, Fox, and so on, get the same content. But it's just easier for people to go to one place and get 
almost all their shows. And it's for free. And it's for free, it's ad supported. If you're doing it on, on your computer, so if you're doing it on a bigger screen or a smaller screen, it's gonna cost you money. That's not very, uh, uh, I guess, intuitive for people, but that's the way it works right now. Um, the other, when it comes to movies, the most popular with over 20 million subs is Netflix. And there it's an eight, eight bucks a month subscription and you get you know, 20, access to 20,000 movies. But then you know, many more people than use Netflix and Hulu use you know, s services like BitTorrent or Megavideo where they get access to all that content for free, but you know, also you know, not respecting the, you know, the copyrights of, uh, of the content owners. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, bit torrent T O R R E N T. The the short version of you know what it's like, I would say, to the key thing you skill you need to start cord cutting is you know that button on your remote that switches between the inputs on the TV. You need to be conversant with that. Because what it involves right now, because there is no one site or device or service that has everything, you're switching from a lot of, instead of one pipe that delivers all the stuff you could ever want and then all this crap you don't want. You know, you go to one site for some things, another program for different things. So in my case, I have a TV that has some basic internet widgets. So I can watch movies off, rent it off Amazon's video on demand service just from the TV with that remote. I can watch Netflix programs if queued up um, there, there's some various other sites, but then some things, if I want to rent a movie off iTunes, then I have to connect a laptop to the TV, so that's a different setup. Um, you know, maybe there, there's something I have on an iPhone, that's, then I've got to connect it to a dock, that's something else entirely. So you do need to, you know, if, if there are whole buttons on the remote that have never gotten used before, you will need to sort of get acquainted with them. And so it's, not, it's, it's easy to start with something like, say, just Hulu for your TV shows, and then uh, Amazon Video On Demand for the movies you want to rent, or Netflix if you want to pay just the eight bucks a month up front. Right. Um, but also remember that a good portion of, I'm guessing a good portion of you are creators, right? We're, all talk, we're talking about all this. Yeah. Yay, creators. Yeah. We're, we're talking about all this in terms of uh, uh, the end user experience, though, right? We're not talking about you all who are actually creating stuff. Don't look at Hulu. I'm, if you haven't seen Hulu before, don't look at Hulu and say, I want to go to there, because you will not be able to. You can't get on Hulu. Um, which is why you have to go for Miro. But um, uh, but these are you know there there's a it's you know the the uh, Kevin Slavin really smart cat um, said something about how if if he worked for the FCC he would long for the days where all video was on one system and you didn't have all these other like rules to to deal with because what's interesting is that um, because you know, major networks are on Hulu. You're only going there for the ma major network stuff, right? There is no one, there's no one stop shop anymore. Um, and each one has its own licensing, set of licensing issues. Each one has its own set of like, one's using Flash, one's using HTML5, so they're not, it's not gonna, end up, it's not gonna be compatible with Boxy, it's not gonna be compatible with Apple TV, that sort of thing. And so there are all these new considerations that you have to kind of keep in mind from the creator yeah. standpoint. Let's go to the next question. Um, in the white shirt there. Or oh, thank you. Beige, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> Whatever. Um, I think that we're sort of uh, skating close to the edge of uh, what seems to be a larger set of um, possibilities here, and particularly in the context of media reform, which is w why we're here. Um, maybe I can start by referring to something, well, actually, two comments. One that, that Anne, is that your name, made about um, the most open ecosystem we can find, and also what Elizabeth said about uh, Sweden and this, what I guess is a 100 megabit um, symmetrical system. Now, I've often wondered why don't we have the possibility, in this country at least, of, of a symmetrical system, and it, it has sometimes occurred to me that they want to keep producers, I mean, all of us could be producers, could be producing our own content. Is, is that the real fear that, that lies behind this? But I can imagine a world in, in which free speech TV and anybody else who wants to produce alternative content or just their own fun stuff doesn't have to go through Hulu or any of these other packaging uh, systems. They can 
stream their video directly. They can work out their own business model if they need one. It can be a, a you know, a PBS style um, uh, fund drive kind of thing if that's the way they want to do it. But I mean, can we talk about those kinds of things a little bit and imagine the real possibilities, not just sort of clever ways that we can sort of, you know, use the technology <laughs> in, in um, you know, using our, our own uh, tech savvy, but can we imagine how we can use this to really reform media itself? I, I, I think that the idea of independent producers is absolutely one of the things that terrifies the mainstream media system. Um, and you can see that, I think, in something that we're pretty familiar with, which is for the last six years, uh, mainstream media representatives uh, talking about, oh, that's just like that YouTube stuff. Uh, that's just cat videos. Um, and really demeaning what uh, is out there and, and acting like, oh, that's just very trivial stuff, not like these important high quality things that we do here on cable. Um, and I think that, that now that there's really no way that they can continue to make that ridiculous claim um, or, or also pretend that those things don't matter to people, uh, that, that they're really nervous and that that's part of what is causing these structural uh, changes that people are pushing for, uh, that, that mainstream media companies are pushing for to limit those possibilities. And, and just to note, I, I'm not sure if any of us said this, but Hulu is owned by NBC, uh, and NBC uh, is uh, being acquired. Is acquired by uh, Comcast. So. Um, and I would only add to this that, you know, I, I actually personally feel like it's less of the tinfoil hat they're afraid of us mm -hmm. and more of they're afraid of people going and redistributing their content. Um, the, you know, the, 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 the bulk of, is the bulk of traffic still, no, bulk of traffic still isn't BitTorrent, is it? I forgot, online. Uh, video. Whatever it is, but it's video still, video. right? It's streaming video. And so it's, it's, it's video that's being produced by somebody and then taken and, and, and for the most part being redistributed by somebody else. Uh, possibly without the proper licensing, and that is what they're afraid of. They're afraid. They're scared of their own of their own product being used in ways that they didn't intend, um, which means both uh, uh, things like offering you're offering movies for free, but it also means taking yourself and remixing it and turning it into new content and everything else. So it's it's a fun thing. I don't think there's a conspiracy theory, by the way, among the cable companies trying to like limit upload rates or anything like that. I think. It's incompetence that is generated by lack of competition more than anything else. The reason that we don't have as good as infrastructure. Also, you know, some of it is politics, and you know, the U.S. is a much bigger country than Denmark or, or Sweden or Norway. Um, and if you wanna, if you wanna battle between conflicting interests, which is have broadband for everybody, have high speeds for, you know, for people who have broadband and make it affordable, those are free conflicting interests. Right? So you can decide as the U.S. Um, government that you want to encourage high-speed broadband, but you'll have to concentrate it like in urban centers. That's not going to go well with people that live in less populated areas and have you know, very limited broadband. So they want that budget too. And definitely the infrastructure companies uh, don't have motivation to put on serious infrastructure to remote locations. So I, I think there's, you know, some of it is incompetence that has to do with uh, the monopolist nature of those industries, and some of it has to do with uh, policy that is, you know, in conflict with the different goals that, you know, the FCC would like to achieve. So, uh, and, and I agree with a lot of what's been said. I do think that the policy we've decided, are, I think we've decided bad policies. I don't think it's simply a conflict and we've done the best we can. I think we've chosen, you know, in other countries, the biggest cities have higher speeds and lower prices, and they also have more, um, they, they, have, they have more deployment and better, better services in rural areas as well. Right? So it's, it's also just bad policy, it's not just trade-offs. Um, and so in terms, of, in terms of the vision you're thinking of, uh, you know, Abner mentioned some of the technologies. There's a, you know, Boxy has a box you could buy, right, in this box, or, and, and there's also a Roku, so a box you can buy and you can connect it uh, you can connect the internet to your TV. And a lot of TVs you buy today are internet enabled, so you can download TV apps and watch TV through the internet through these TV apps. And so the world you could imagine would be a world where 
right? The TV apps would include Free Speech TV, and I'm sure Free Speech TV has an app. And the Miro app allows you to watch Free Speech TV, right, on your big TV screen in high definition, right, it's coming through the internet. And so imagine a world where you have, you know, any app for any TV channel you want out there that exists now. So you like watching, I don't know, Al Jazeera and all these international news stations. You want every international news station. You could get the app for all of them and watch them on your TV screen, on your big screen in high definition. Once enough people are watching TV through apps, through the internet on their big TV screen, then that's a market for other people to just make an app instead of trying to get on cable. And then people could then have their own apps. So the, the, the vision we have uh, you know, the ultimate picture in terms of media reform would be one where you know, no cable company or gatekeeper controls the things that you can watch on your TV screen, and people would be able to, to, you know, to create an app on an open platform, and you could watch anything that's out there. And you could be a creator, or you could have all this choice. That's really, that's really the, the world we want to end up at. And a lot of this technological discussion, uh, you know, at, at the moment, it's all about you know, hooking up this device to that device and then figuring out how to do it, because it's not as easy as it should be, right? But, um, but the, the ultimate goal is to have in, you know, infinite choice for you that then spawns more creators to then feed that infinite choice in a feedback loop. Right. Let's go to the next question. Uh, halfway towards the, by that uh, huge tripod thing. Hi. Well, I'll stand here. Um, I just feel like uh, people are being a little glib about uh, public access. Um, uh, saying that, oh, well, you know, we should just be more creative thinking and um, we'll survive and we're just kind of stuck in the franchise model. And I understand that uh, franchising is probably going to go away. But um, you have to realize that uh, we can put our programs on the web. That's fine. But are poor people going to be able to have a camera? Are they going to have a community space where they can meet other people and, and uh, produce programs? Are they going to have a studio? No, they're not. Maybe they'll have a flip cam, but I just feel like people are putting access down. But the people with the flip cams are getting 15, 100 million views on YouTube. So why does that matter anymore? Um, you don't need a studio. Um, you don't need this giant infrastructure anymore. You should put your stuff online. But what, what access is able to provide are those community technology centers, are those place, spaces where you can actually create those third, the, the third pl places where you can actually congregate and be able to do things where it's not, you're not necessarily just at a frickin' Starbucks, right? And that's important to have. Um, whether or not PEG survives, I think it's gonna be tied to whether or not you're able to uh, accept that. Because that's all that matters, is your role in the community. The technology means crap. I have to point out, we, we are privileged to have NPR's Andy Carvin in the front row, and this is an example of, you know, the people whose video you're retweeting, I, I don't think they have a whole lot of technological resources, but they have a phone, and, you know, if you catch someone's eye, a whole lot of people could see your work. I, I certainly don't want to put down uh, PEG access, and I actually think that, that there are really strong opportunities for a PEG. Um, in the new ecosystem, but I do, I do think that there is a bit of a tension between PEG's mission and PEG's current funding model, and I think that that's something that has to be interrogated, and, and I don't say that to be mean to, to PEG stations, but just because I think that I want to see PEG survive because I think it's critical to our communities, so I want to see us grappling with how can we make it really strong, how can we make it really um, encompassing of the diverse voices in our communities? How can we make sure that it's getting out there? How can we make sure um, that it's not gonna be blocked by uh, an app store that doesn't allow donations um, or that doesn't allow total free speech? Um, and so I, I think that, that these are issues that, that PEG needs to grapple with because it's so important, not at all because it's unimportant. We, uh, next question, I guess. Uh, yeah, and the, uh, She's two rows behind you. Hi, I'm Joe Margolis. Um, I just, I have an interest in learning from this panel what can be done, what, what is required of us to preserve our rights to cut our cords, because that's the issue that seems to be at hand that's the most important for us to take away. Otherwise, I mean, I've come away with some pretty good life hacking tips that I can take back to Charlotte, but I'd love to learn about, 
you know, movement building as relates to policy making in terms of uh, protecting this so that we can move towards a fully participatory technology. Uh, I think that I'd love to hear some feedback from the panel on that. So I'm gonna, I'll begin with something pretty general, which is a few years ago I was trying to convince uh, an organization to, to start a movement, just a, a sort of campaign to encourage everyone to cut the cord. Right? I mean, right, because we need consumer education. We need to explain to people, like, hey, it's possible. You can watch broadcast channels over the air. I, I, a lot of my students, like people who were born in the, in the 80s, don't realize that there's a difference between broadcast channels and then you can get, you can get them over the air. But there are cable channels, and you, don't, you can only get them on cable and satellite. A lot of people don't, like, kids don't realize that. It's all the same thing. They just flip channels and it's different, right? And if you could explain to people, oh, a lot of the sports you want to watch is over the air, and like a little antenna, you can watch it in that high definition, not fuzzy after the digital transition. You just sort of said, you can watch stuff over the air, uh, and you can watch a lot of stuff online. I think what you should do, Joe, is start a campaign, right, to encourage people to cut the cord, right? Just hit, you know, hit them in their bottom line, right? Get people moving in that direction, and how do you start a campaign? Uh, you know, there are lots of people who have thoughts on that. We could talk about it uh, afterward. I, there are lots of different tools, and I think it's the, the, the idea is you know, to, to figure out, I mean, if there's, what I would want is I would want to explain to someone, here's the simplest way to cut the cord. You buy this device that costs this much money. You, you, you plug in, you know, here's some software we've, we're, we're, that's open source that we're distributing that you just upload on that device, or these are the apps that you download, um, you know, Miro or whatever. And in three easy steps, anyone can have access to these things. And just sort of almost you know, two options for people, sports lovers and non-sports lovers, <laughs> to cut the cord and then start a campaign that makes it easy for people to spread the word. And once you have, I don't know, uh, a few hundred thousand people, then at some point you get like, you know, it, it sort of takes on a life of its own. So, I, so that's, I, I'd love to see you start, to start a campaign and that'd be my, my advice to you or anyone who, who has the, the skill and the ingenuity to do it. I, I also think it's sometimes easy to think of um, when we're discussing accessing media to feel like it's life hacking um, until you really need to access Al Jazeera and you can't get it anywhere. So I think some of, sometimes some of this feels like it's just about consumer choice and is really trivial, but actually it can really be about our free speech and, and what we're allowed to, uh, what we're able to see, what we're able to access, and what we're able to produce, and how we're able to distribute it. I would also just add that um, broadband, to me, is so incredibly important to preserving our rights to be cord cutters. And as consumers and as citizens, we need to demand uh, you know, better broadband, more choices, uh, faster speeds, uh, symmetrical connections, and all the things along those lines in order to preserve our ability to have a more democratized uh, digital media environment. There, there's one question from Twitter, uh, which I think is worth sharing. How are, how are video sites promoting themselves? How is that going to change? The, the person says it's very difficult to get someone's attention right now. Now, obviously, if, I guess if you can get any of us to Twitter out your link, maybe that'll work. But <laughs> You know, on the one hand, yes, anyone can publish a video on the internet. How do you then get in people's faces and I get, think get people to tune I in? I think it's going to get worse because you're just going to have more and more choice. So to get above the noise is going to be very difficult unless you can spend a lot of money. But I think what's going to happen, which I ho what I hope is going to happen, is that discovery is going to get democratized. Um, today, you know, the cable companies, the gatekeeper, they decide the channel lineup and you, you know, channels live and die by it and if you can't get your content on cable then you're just not there. On the internet, um, there, are, there are new gatekeepers, you know, if, uh, if you're featured on Apple it has a huge meaning, but you know, they control that, uh, that front store. But I think what we've seen with Twitter and Facebook is suddenly we can be the gatekeepers. So if people discover news through their Twitter, uh, the people that they follow on Twitter and Facebook, you know, it's not Google, it's not Twitter, the company, it's not Facebook, the company that decides what they get to see. It's actually their friends. So I think if that's going to happen around video, and it's, it's not cheap, it's happening and it's going to happen more in a big way that's going to be a major driver for video discovery, then we're in a much better place as, as independent content owners because we just need to get the word out to our friends and create great content and it can get a viral 
distribution, which today does not exist. So I, I think for, the, for any of us, most of us, they don't have the money to spend on getting you know, billboards and ads going on. We're in a much better place than we are today because it's gonna get democratized. It's almost cliche at this point to say it, but I think that curation without, uh, without gatekeeper uh, limitations is really where it's at. Um, and, and whether that's the Miro Guide or I work on a project called Miro Community where we have local community partners curate the media in their community uh, or whether that's Kickstarter's new curated pages, I think that's really where you're gonna start seeing the way that you connect people with content that they're interested in. Um, you know, when you have a trusted member of your community, if, if Andy Carvin here, uh, when he tweets something, I pay attention to it and then I follow those things. I don't look through all of Twitter. Um, so, but that there's also nothing stopping anyone else from becoming a curator, as opposed to something like the Apple uh, iTunes Store, where you have the one gatekeeper. Let's take another question from the uh, audience. Can I just make a oh, quick please. comment? I just wanted to um, bring up the issue that while the potential for, uh, I guess, social graph-based curation on networks like Facebook and Twitter is potentially great, those are also, in particular, Facebook, um, but also Twitter in some ways, centralized services that do have the capability to censor. And I know that there was a panel on this yesterday, but we have seen scenarios where, for example, Facebook will censor any links with a particular domain and URL. So for example, Facebook uh, censors any links to the Pirate Bay. And in fact, there are many um, Creative Commons licensed legitimate files up on the Pirate Bay. I once tried to post a link on Facebook to one of those, a Creative Commons licensed book by my colleague Jonathan Zittrain, who spoke on the panel yesterday, and Facebook censored it. So um, we cannot merely rely on these centralized, again, gatekeepers in the sense that they also have the potential to censor. So there are a lot of alternatives now. Diaspora, if some people have heard about it, they're um, a decentralized, open source, pr privacy aware social networks. But a lot of people are thinking about ways such that you wouldn't have the capacity to censor in this manner. And if I could just add one thing, uh, I, I think everything that you all said was completely correct and that social is, is the thing that you really have to pay attention to. Uh, I think that it is going to get easier. Um, you're just not going to attract the same, you're not going to attract the audiences you, you, that, you, that you have in your wildest dreams because the idea of audience is going to change. It's, it's going to be about creating a community um, of users. And um, I've spent the last uh, few months doing work with, uh, doing work with broadcasts and getting to them to understand that the way that you distribute online and the way that you um, get people to come across yourself, do discovery online, isn't through, um, isn't through sort of big iron um, uh, marketing campaigns, but through social, and it's working. So I think we have time for one last question before I get the hook. Uh, yeah, you had your hand up a while back. Uh, you mentioned something in terms of the digital Ch the change from analog to digital that happened a while ago. You've got this clear signal. Yeah, but it breaks up all the time, and if you're not in the right direction to the right thing. My parents have been cable-free their entire lives. They're thinking about switching to cable because they can get more channels, oddly enough. And I'm saying, not yet. <laughs> Internet is coming, but I don't know if it's coming fast enough for them. And they're saying, you know, do you with the cables get that same digital breakup that we get now that we never used to because we could watch an analog picture? So. I don't know what I'm really asking here, but. <laughs> um, so yeah. The, yeah. Uh, actually, what <laughs> so yeah, there, I mean, there's a big, I mean, we, we all notice it when we try to use uh, our cell phones, right? There's a different, big difference between quality of service that we once had when we all had landlines and we were all using analog uh, television, uh, but we also had a lot less choice and we had also had a lot less, uh, we, we, you know, you, you, you deal with quality issues in or, or quality degradation in order to have more access and in order to have more choice. Um, that's just something we've, uh, I feel like we've learned to live with. Every single time I see a camera phone video show up on, uh, I was gonna say CNN, but Al Jazeera, um, you know, I see that, that immediacy, that information is more important than the quality that we've always qual that we've always, that we've always thought that had, you know, that had to be it. Um, and people are just gonna have to accept that. I'll say, I mean, I've, I've seen both sides of it. Actually, I grew up in a house where we only watched TV over the air because we had this enormous antenna suspended in the attic. I live in, lived in the sticks in New Jersey. Um, and now, you know, 
I never had really worthwhile analog reception any place I've lived in or around DC. And with digital, I do. And, you know, yeah, there are some channels, 50 is kind of, they have a weak signal, so it's not really worth trying to watch a Nats game on them on Sundays. But all the networks do come in very strong. And I've talked to people who have been able to cut the cord in large part because you get this perfect reception for free. But sometimes it doesn't work. And usually the answer is try a different antenna. You know, if you live far enough out, you may need that antenna in the attic or on the roof. Uh, you know, there, there are, there's a site called HDTVExpert.com where this guy talks about the, the, the rig he had to set up for somebody in rural Vermont to get a signal from 50 miles away on the wrong side of a hill. It can be made to work, but it's not easy. And, you know, to the extent we can make that easier, that will put a little more fear into the cable companies. And with that, we are out of time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.